I am unbelievably excited to bring to you today's episode about orgasms. Rarely does my editor send me an email without me prompting about what she thought of the episode, and she emailed me after this was edited and said, oh my God, this is amazing, and when I re-listened to it, I can't agree more. Dr. Rachel Rubin, who is a sexual medicine specialist and board-certified urologist, talks to us today about anything and everything we want to know about orgasms. And I would like to thank those of you who've been vulnerable enough to reach out to me with your questions, because quite honestly, none of us are taught about this. We don't want to talk about it. We don't even know how to talk about it if we do want to have the conversation. And quite honestly, I only know how my body works, so I don't know what issues others may face. And so this is not a dull, overly scientific conversation, but it is based in research and medicine. And I can assure you, you will learn a ton. So please do take a listen to this incredible discussion and a huge thank you to Dr. Rubin and all of her colleagues who are so passionate about making sure the right information gets out there about our sexual health. I guess first what strikes me is as a woman or as a human, like men, women, AFBs, like you name it, no one is, there's no course to say, this is what a great sex life can be. This is how the body can and should work. None of that. So, and I have interviewed a few sexual health experts and one interesting statement that one made was it seems like good is how you define it. But quite honestly, like, since I don't even know what good is, I may define it in a way that's totally subpar from what's possible. So, I don't know how you would respond to, to that, but I would like to just help us all understand what is an orgasm and like, how could we define what good could look like? I think it's such a great question. And, and when we look at medicine, um, we actually, uh, I'm doing a project right now with a bunch of medical students and they went to Reddit and they looked at a thread of Reddit called, I believe it was uh, 2X chromosomes or something like that. And they just were uh, gathering data from understanding what are the questions people are asking about orgasm, libido, you know, those types of things. And we're publishing this, um, we're presenting it at a meeting soon. And one of the fascinating things was when it comes to libido, there was a lot of mention of, oh, medications caused this, or I went to my doctor and my doctor didn't give me the time of day, but they were going to doctors about these questions, right? For libido. When it came to orgasm, the word doctor was nowhere to be found, right? So when women had problems with their orgasm or questions about orgasm, there was no mention from either the poster or the people responding of like, well, what does your doctor have to say about that? And so orgasm is not really sort of within the medical community as something, who do you go to if you have an orgasm problem? Um, and, and this idea of, oh, it must all be in your head. It must all be due to your religious upbringing. It must all be due to your repressed nature or something, or you're not trying the right way. That's not necessarily correct. And sort of this biopsychosocial model that we think of, we forget about the biology part, right? That an orgasm is this massive, incredible um, a, a reflex, if you will, right? It's this buildup, it's this release, it's this magical dance between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. And there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't understand about the biology behind it, but we know more than people really give us credit for, especially also on the male side as well. And I, I take care of all genders, but this idea of, it's biology. And when you think of biology, there may be a biological solution to help you improve or see if we can change or even allow for an orgasm. But because this is the unmentionables and the private parts and the things nobody speaks of, it's just not talked about. And, and uh, you can think on your own and your listeners uh, you can all think, has a doctor ever asked you if you can have an orgasm? Right, I can start simply from there. I myself have been to many a doctors in my time on earth and I've never been asked the question. Doctors know what I do for a living. I am a sex doctor and I've never been asked the question, right, never. And so I guarantee that most of your listeners have never been asked the simple question, 
can you have an orgasm? Let alone, do you have questions about your orgasm? Do you have complaints about your orgasm? Do you have any problems? And so it, it the data shows it takes a long time for a patient to bring it up with a doctor. And most of the time they get dismissed or they get um, sort of ignored uh, or the doctor doesn't have an answer for them. And that's a big problem because there are a lot of biological things that can affect your orgasm, not just psychosocial, though there are many of those as well. First, how would someone know that they had an orgasm? I don't know if we start there because, you know, I've spoken to few. And again, we women don't even talk to each other that much. I have a few that will share things with me. Usually it's after a couple of glasses of wine, Mm -hmm. but not that many. And, you know, yeah, but I have heard a few different experiences that again, because I only know my body and it's not like there's a book out there or maybe there is, and I just haven't found it, but like, what should it feel like and how long should it last and how many times can it happen in a night and all that? So it's such fabulous questions. And, and again, is there are, um, there was a big discussion about this at the recent uh, course that we taught and sort of the, there's a famous Supreme Court justice quote about pornography of, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it, you know, and this idea of orgasm is, well, I, I, you know, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it and you'll know it when you have it, which is not helpful for women. Um, and there's a lot of sort of um, ideas. So there's some uh, people who will say, oh, well, maybe you've had one. You just don't know it. We don't even trust you as a woman to know when you've had an <laughs> orgasm, which is a not good. Um, And then there's different levels of orgasm and there's different maybe types of orgasm, right? So there are women, you know, orgasm is a fascinating thing that there are women who orgasm, um, most commonly women don't orgasm from penetration. And so the problem is because the media and pornography is people think that that's the norm is that people orgasm from penetration. And that's only like less than like 12% of people actually orgasm that, that way. But those women, those women are loud, right? They are, those humans are loud. Why? So, so I have a theory. Okay. This is my theory. I have to scientifically prove this. You're hearing this first. So I treat uh, all genders, right? There is a a subset of, of people with penises who have what's called premature ejaculation or early ejaculation that they orgasm faster than they want to. Okay. It's very distressing to people with penises where they often in a minute or less, just light touch will have them orgasm and they complain, they come to the urologist and, and really there are things we can do to help, help them. It's not hopeless. There are things we can do to help it's a small percentage of people with penises who have early ejaculation, right? I believe that it is the same small percentage of uh, women with clitoris or people with clitorises who orgasm very easily, light touch, uh, very uh, light sensation, nipple stimulation in their like, very sensitive areas and their reflex just happens faster. In penises, it's a disaster. And in clitorises, it's life-changing, amazing. You're a unicorn. You are like, uh, you, you brag about it because, because, uh, 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 women can have multiple orgasms. Right. And so, and when I say women here, I mean, anyone who identifies as a right, women can have multiple orgasms. They don't have a refractory period. And so for someone who can orgasm easily and can orgasm in multiple ways, it's a very exciting, very wonderful thing to have. But I think biologically, they're probably pretty similar. And it's just one person's perfect situation is another person's sexual health disaster. Does that make sense? Yes. Interesting. Now, what about, so you mentioned that there's multiple ways to stimulate. Um, I guess any advice on how someone can practice and better understand it or learn the different ways, or like, what if, you know, like, maybe some will, like you said, um, through even nipple stimulation, it's very easy. What if someone has no sensation in their nipples? Like, you know, can that happen? Or, you know, are these, um, things of just how their body's structured or is it that, um, there's something psychological and once they get more in touch with their body, they could feel that like, you know, tell me more about how all that works together. The answer is yes, all of the above. And so when I see someone who has, you know, I teach uh, and treat and and listen to people and think about uh, humans with biology in them in mind right anatomy in mind i say okay what is the anatomy and how does it work and how can we make it work better now anatomy is fascinating because you have to understand that people don't understand basic anatomy people i show pictures of clitoris and penis all the time next to each other and and showing uh, people that the reason most people don't orgasm from penetration is because the female phallus, the clitoris, the female erectile tissue is not anywhere near the vagina. 
right? And so how on earth, right? If you're a man, and for all my male listeners, if you rub the inside of your leg, inside of your leg, rub it for five and a half minutes, are you going to have an orgasm? No, right? Why? Well, because Dr. Rubin is nowhere near my penis, right? But it's really close to your penis, just really inside of your leg, hit it really hard for five and a half minutes. Are you going to have an orgasm? Of course not, right? because it's nowhere near your penis. So the idea that any woman can orgasm from penetration is nothing short of miraculous, in which case there is another mechanism by which is happening, either a uterine orgasm, a cervical orgasm, or very sensitive clitoral stimulation allows that person to orgasm. And they are what I call my ninja unicorns, and they should be exalted in one and, and very happy and proud of what they can achieve. But that is not the norm. And so when I see someone with um, orgasm problems, I think very strategically of is it a tissue local problem? Is it an anatomical problem, right? Is it an education problem that they're just not trying the right way? Is it a nerve problem or spinal cord problem where your brain and your genitals are just not connecting, right? Or is it a brain problem where it's uh, medications that have caused the delay or it's, um, you know, a psychosocial issues or relationship issues or, um, you know, a different things that can cause, you know, brain issues. And the not trying the right way is actually often very common, right? Because people don't know the basic anatomy and the basic function. If a penis were completely internal, right? And, and some guys have a penis that, that is maybe very excess weight or something like that, where a penis can be buried on the inside. How does somebody like that have an orgasm? There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to stimulate. It's a challenge, right? And the majority of the clitoris is buried beneath the skin. And that's why vibration is so fabulously wonderful for people to have orgasm, not because their partners aren't skilled, not because their partners don't have the right moves or the right touch or the right, this. it's because it's buried underneath the surface. And so that vibration will stimulate you in a way to allow for orgasm and allow for that pleasure. Does that make sense? Yes. And understanding the anatomy behind that is so important because then I can look at the patient in front of me and everyone's different. That's why I love my job because everyone is slightly different and figure out what are the things that we can do. Is it medications? Is it the anatomy? Is it the the lack of, of figuring out, you know, what to do or what device to get? And then we can come up with a plan and the, a team to like, okay, what can we do to maximize your quality of life and your pleasure? Because that is so important. It's so valued and undervalued in the world, but it's so important. And uh, it is so fun to get to help with. I admit when I first started working on trying to figure out how I can take the experiences that I had with um, my fertility to help other women not have all these like long delays for trying to find treatments and diagnosis. I had originally thought, wouldn't it be so cool to help people understand what works? The more I dove in, the more I'm like, honestly, the answer is it depends. So if you see that story where there's that one in a million person on Instagram who magically did that one thing, we don't know their medical history. So the answer is it depends. So I'm going to see if we can get away, if we can find any specifics that might help, even if it's guidance, maybe mm -hmm. questions to ask a doctor, things to, because what I will say is the theme I do find is you need to know the basics to know what to monitor in your body to then know how to talk to your doctor. Would, mm -hmm. would you say that's a fair statement? Totally. Okay. And, and just as you said, be the CEO for your own healthcare and to say to yourself, my decreased orgasm or lack of orgasm or muted orgasm or a lack of orgasm matters to me, in which case it's a medical problem. As soon as you say the words, it matters to me, I am bothered by my lack of X, Y, Z, it matters and it should matter to your doctor. And if you go to your doctor with that complaint and your doctor's not adequately addressing, that means it's not the right doctor for you. And there are other doctors like myself and my colleagues who care so much about this and, and invest so much time and energy and want the field to get better. So we have more, not just it depends, but more treatment options uh, to give you. What should we monitor? Because I would hate for someone to go to the doctor and they ask a lot of questions. And because the person hasn't been paying attention, they don't have a way to describe and answer any of the questions for the doctor to help. So first of all, if you were to say, okay, for those of you listening, these are the things that I would want to ask you that I'd want you to monitor. And maybe it isn't the case in, in the in orgasm, but I would assume there's some things that they should have some sort of awareness of to come prepared to meet with someone like you. 
So things to monitor, like if you can, if you come to see me and you say, I have a wonderful orgasm with my device, I just can't orgasm with my partner. You know, the question is, is, is it because you're thinking about it the wrong way and you're not able to relax and you're not able to sort of be, um, if, if the penetration is happening, it's very distracting. And so it's very normal for you to need to orgasm separately from penetration. And so that when I see patients like that, or I see a patient who said, I orgasm fine by myself or next to my partner, but I can't orgasm sort of with my partner in me. That's not necessarily a medical problem. That may be more of an educational problem of most people can't do that. And that doesn't mean you can't work towards doing that and find fun ways, but think of it as fun extra fun things to like, how can we make sex more fun and make intimacy more fun as opposed to I am damaged. I am broken. You know, I can't do X, Y, and Z. Does that make sense? Like uh, some percentage of women when they orgasm leak fluid, um, you know, are squirters. Uh, Can you learn how to be a squirter? Well, uh, you know, the data is unclear in that, but the answer is if you're having fun trying, keep trying, right? If you're feeling horrible about yourself because you can't do it, seems counter productive because you may never be able to do it. So one of my questions for you was going to be about, about squirting because I will, I will just be vulnerable and say, I had no idea that that was a thing until I saw that sex in the city episode with Kim Cattrall squirting. And they had a whole discussion about it. You mentioned that some can, some can't possible to train yourself. I'm just curious if you were to give someone like any general tips on that anything that would help someone learn how to do it, of course, without creating the anxiety if it doesn't work. But I'm curious if you had any tips. So squirting is a fascinating thing where, and I just got texted by a colleague today, said I have a patient who's mortified that she's leaking every time she orgasm and her boyfriend is going to leave her. And I said, well, it sounds like, I said, it's, I wrote this in my text this morning. I said, it sounds like she needs a boyfriendectomy. She needs to get rid of the boyfriend because there are entire porn sites where categories devoted to the wonders of female, you know, ejaculation and female squirting. And so, um, we don't, we, we know that it's likely if there's a large volume that comes out when you have an orgasm, it's likely urine. There's no other resources. There is ejaculatory fluid and there's some uh, lubrication and things that women make, but we don't have large stores of volume the way men have seminal vesicles and can produce, uh, you know, ejaculate, which isn't that much volume either. And so if there's a large volume that comes out when you orgasm, it is urine. It's not okay. dangerous. It's not going to hurt anyone. It's not going to, you know, it's no big deal. Put a towel down. If you and your partner enjoy it, keep going and enjoy it. One person's pornography fetish fantasy is just like the text I got this morning, another patient's nightmare, end of relationship, horrific kind of moment. And so again, in the same theory of one person's sexual um, wonder is another person's sexual nightmare. And we have to understand the patient in front of you. And so we think that it's this relaxation of the pelvic floor at orgasm that allows, and then there's this bladder contraction and your bladder squeezes because every part, right? Orgasm is a buildup of, you know, tension and then a release of tension. And at that sort of moment of maximal release, some women will relax their bladders, their bladders will squeeze, urine will come out. And it's very hard to control, you know, because it's this moment of almost like a seizure. You're literally having a seizure when you orgasm, your brain can't sort of process anything. And so this sort of um, reflex takes over. And so can you learn to relax to the level and the degree to allow that to happen? There are some tutorials online, which I won't uh, suggest or recommend that think (laughs) that you can, right? And so the right device, the right, you know, I've had patients find a device and they email me right away and said, oh my God, I, you know, I'm having orgasms that I've never had before due to this device and it's pleasurable for them. So I recommend they keep, you know, doing it and adding it to their toolbox. Interesting. And by the way, it is so funny what you said about one person's, you know, amazing thing could be another person's horrifying experience. And it it just goes to kind of a lot of the things we discuss, like with the squirting and sex in the city, they were like, it's the coolest thing ever. And I have always been fascinated by it. And then you tell me about the text and I'm like, really? But, you know, I was trained by Sex in the City saying it's amazing. And just like with pornography, telling in our minds that penetration is how most people orgasm when in fact that is not it. So it really is interesting how if you're not fully aware of how something is supposed to work and you're not trained on it, whatever is out there in the public becomes your reality. 
So I and, appreciate and, your sharing all this. And, and understanding that your partner had just as crappy of sex education as you had. So this idea that your partner is supposed to be able to know all of your buttons and all of your body and how it works when you don't always know yourself is crazy, right? Like you're, that you're going to find this magical unicorn of a partner that just gets it and knows exactly where to go. Because most people find it difficult to talk about sex, find even with the person that they are having sex with to say, ooh, a little to the left or harder or softer, or, you know, ooh, it would feel really good if, A, most people don't feel comfortable saying that, B, most people don't even know what instructions that they would give. And the partners, you think your partner has any clue? No, they just got the same crappy sex education in middle school that you got. So it becomes important to say, well, where are we learning this education? Is it all pornography? Because that's like learning, you know, um, I mean, it's just all fake, right? So it's learning in a totally the wrong sort of way to do things. So it's really the education piece that becomes really important and getting good evidence-based sort of people out there giving good advice. And we don't have all the answers, right? If you think your doctors have all the answers, like, of course we don't. That's what makes medicine fun is that we're continuously asking questions and learning new things. Okay. Interesting. One person had said, when I have an orgasm, I get a headache. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us a bit about what might be happening there? And I presume there's potentially several different causes of it, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that. It's actually really important that you see a physician if you're getting very bad headaches. Um, oftentimes I find that hormones can play a big role, especially when you're in the menopause uh, phase of your life that uh, sometimes with the right hormones, those can go away. But when you, if you get very severe headaches, you do want to see likely a neurologist to just make sure you don't have something very severe going on. Um, no aneurysms, no AV malformations, no tumors, you know, things that you just want to make sure that at this point, you know, when you're orgasming, it's this very big buildup of tension, you know, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up and almost like a stress test, right? So if you have those people on a treadmill and they get chest pain, we're worried about them having a heart attack. And so if you're at this point of maximum stress of your body and you're getting a very severe headache, you just want to make sure that it's not something scary and dangerous. And so you want to take that very seriously. So I do think it's likely nothing. It's likely sort of a hormonal imbalance or something not scary, but you definitely want to make sure the scary things get rolled out. Talk to us about the importance of getting in the mood. So getting in the mood, I think foreplay should be totally uh, taken out of our, um, uh, our, our vernacular. Like we should not use the word foreplay because it doesn't make any sense. Like it should all be sex right? We're having sex because most like the idea of we had sex usually means men penetrated woman and orgasmed inside of her. And that is sex. And anything else is not successful sex, right? Anything else is not like we didn't have sex. We did other things. We did foreplay. We just heavy petted. We, but female orgasm, if it's valued, if it's valued equally as the male orgasm, if we're talking in a heterosexual situation, um, it should be equal. In fact, women can have multiple orgasms. So the ratio should be many orgasms on the female side to one orgasm on the male side. But what we find when looking at the data is there's a huge orgasm gap for every orgasm a man has, a heterosexual woman has 66% the number of orgasms. And so there is a huge, I believe we can fix the pay gap if we can fix the orgasm gap, because women do not value their pleasure and their orgasm the same way men do. And so when a woman has sex with someone, right, uh, say it's heterosexual, penis and vagina, man ejaculates, I had sex. Whether she orgasmed or not, she had sex right? If a man didn't orgasm, is he going to say, I had sex and I did this thing? It's, it's looked at as, oh, it was a failure, right? It was a failed mission. I didn't succeed. And so we have to change the way we look at sex, because if we value ourselves as women, we deserve equality in the bedroom as, you know, our male counterparts. And if we're going to demand equality, then we at least have to demand orgasm equality. And so that takes that empowerment of saying, my orgasm is important here. My pleasure is important. And if you can't orgasm, and that's, not to say that orgasm is the only way to have good sex. If it gives you pleasure, if it gives you intimacy, if you're enjoying yourself, it's good sex. So I think getting in the mood is going to be different for each gender and each person individually. And so you have to advocate for yourself of what gets you in the mood. And so um, really taking the time of like, maybe it's a bubble bath, maybe it's a reading something sexy, maybe it's watching something that gets you in the mood, maybe it's a massage, maybe it's a, a device or a vibrator or something like that. That should be equally as valued as the five and a half minutes it takes for your partner to penetrate and have an orgasm. 
and I'm assuming you've heard of Dipsy and I don't know if you've also heard of Rosie. Rosie's newer. I just hung okay. out with the creator of Rosie at the conference. Uh, I love her. She's a good Oh, friend. you're kidding. I'm going to have her on the podcast. She's great. I'm really, really excited. Good. I'm glad you connected. Uh, She's wonderful. Yeah. And um, Dipsy is amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. I'll admit I, I used it. I met the founder at um, this Founders Friday event that they had in Manhattan where all the founders of companies would meet up and talk and connect and she told her story and um, also the challenges of being able to get on social media because she kept getting blocked for being porn. Mm-hmm. And actually, Lindsay with Rosie also shared the exact same story. And uh, I'm, I'm noticing that more and more is becoming available. But I tell you, I'm like, Facebook, I get you got an algorithm. But come on, get with the times. <laughs> but anyways, ladies, those are great tools. So you got to check them out. So the G-spot, I've seen there is one, there isn't one. Where is the G-spot? What is the G-spot? Tell us. I love the question. So the G-spot is this idea, and I met Beverly Whipple, who was the first person to describe the G-spot, is the idea that some women enjoy uh, stimulation of what we call the anterior vaginal wall or the top of the vagina. So if you stick your finger in a vagina and make sort of a come hither uh, motion, it is that top side of the vagina that gives some people pleasure. Now, if you take that tissue and you chop it up and look it under a microscope, there's not much there in the sense of there's no one spot, there's no one magic organ, there's no one button to push that will give unlimited pleasure. But if you look at that tissue and you start staining it for nerves and for something called prostate specific antigen, it starts to light up. So it turns out that it is likely, and this is something that is not uh, fully agreed upon by all humans in the world, but it is the embryologic equivalent of the female prostate, of the prostate, right? So not female prostate, it's prostate tissue. Now prostate, the prostate is a very hormone sensitive tissue. Men who have high testosterone, you know, like, so the prostate is, um, grows and shrinks based on sort of how much hormones are around. And so women don't have a lot of testosterone around. We have about 10 times less testosterone than our male counterparts. So it doesn't form into like a full organ the same way it does in men, but it's still the embryologic tissue equivalent, looks the same under the microscope, has lots of nerve endings. And if you've ever met a man who enjoys uh, anal penetration, which many men do, why? Because the prostate is filled with all these nerve endings. And when you stimulate the prostate, it's pleasurable. And so for many women, and I believe there's probably a hormone sensitivity where some women run high on testosterone and some women run low on testosterone and different things will cause an elevation or a decrease that there are some women who love their anterior vaginal wall stimulated to the point where they have maybe a G-spot related orgasm, or they're getting at the underside of the clitoris in a way that gives them pleasure and enjoyment. And so the moral of the story is if you like it, do more of it. If you don't like it, you're not broken. And if you want to know if it's something that you like, have fun and add tools to your toolbox to get yourself to have fun in different ways. Because you don't go to the same restaurant every time you go out to eat. You don't go on the same vacations every time you go on vacation, right? Why do we have sex the same way every time? Why don't we think outside the box and add tools to make it more fun, more enjoyable? It's kind of this weird thing of if you're not having sex in a standard way, you know, that you did when you were 19, you're somehow a failure and you're not doing it right. So since we're talking about the anatomy, I wonder if it's helpful to also talk a little bit more about the clitoris, because my understanding is there's only the part that we see, but there's so much more going on there. And we know there's a lot of nerve endings. Um, I think it's the most number of nerve endings in that one spot than anywhere else on your body, if I think I remember correctly. But nonetheless, like I would, I'd love for you to talk to us about um, information that we may not know, but should about the clitoris itself. The clitoris is, um, a fascinating um, a situation because what you see is just kind of the tip of the iceberg. We just see the little head of the clitoris. And in some cases, we don't even see that. There's a, a proportion of women, like 25%, who you can't even see that. And it's all buried underneath. But the clitoris is a big, huge organ that goes all the way down to your butt bones. Okay. So it's um, it's made up of erectile tissue of muscle that it just, uh, engorges and, and, and uh, gets erect. Um, and uh, 
it arouses when it arouses blood fills with it and it, and it, and it gets bigger and uh, it has these little legs that go all the way down to your butt bones on either side almost looks like a wishbone if you will and we don't teach the anatomy very well to um, doctors we don't teach uh, even our textbooks uh, most of them don't have the full anatomy of the clitoris whereas there's very detailed anatomy of the penis and so there's a lot we don't know about the different things that can go wrong and the pathologies that exist and so our research actually looks at the number of, uh, of people with what's called clitoral adhesions, where the hood of the clitoris gets stuck to the head of the clitoris, and uh, how many women have problems with their orgasm or pleasure if it's stuck together. Uh, when men have their foreskin stuck to the head of their penis, it's very painful. They have pain with erections. They go run to the doctor and get treatment for. But no one even looks at clitorises on routine exam, so how are they going to know if that's a problem or if there's an issue. And so we've been doing a lot of research on that specific issue. Um, so it's just fascinating that you have this whole organ and it's a large organ and yet science is just completely wide open and uh, we're trying to do more work and do some research. I just actually got off the call with an amazing group of medical students who are helping me with a research project as we speak. And so I'm hopeful for the future, um, but we still have a long way to go. A couple of uh, interesting things I heard about orgasm. One, I won't lie, it was uh, with Ms. Gwyneth Paltrow. It was like her Netflix series or whatever. And there was someone explaining like how to have like a really long orgasm and how to get into the mood. And one of the things she was talking about, for example, is like rocking the hips very slowly in the beginning. I've actually tried that. I found it definitely works. Um, I'm just curious like about, some of the folks that are providing these tips and what you think about like the hip rocking or if there's other things that we may not think that would help. That's just a small thing. And I found it made a huge impact. Um, but other things like that, that we may not think of that we can just do without necessarily having to go to a doctor um, and can try as something we wouldn't have thought to try. Yeah. I mean, I think again, this idea that if you're starting from the point of I should be orgasming with penetration and that is should be alone, what gives me sexual pleasure, there are so many things to try. There are so many things to do, right? And so um, the, the little button that you see itself is again, is only the tip of the iceberg. And so activating that entire clitoris complex and also the pelvic floor that surrounds it plays a role too. Because remember when orgasm is a buildup of tension and a release to give you pleasure, if your muscles are capable of contracting uh, and releasing fully, then you may have more pleasure than someone if you're starting up here, right? If you have tight pelvic floor muscles or you're, you know, have stress and anxiety and everything's tight, 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 tight. There's not as much room to go up and release if you're never relaxed. Got and it. so we think there's a large, uh, um, there are these brilliant uh, magician humans called pelvic floor physical therapists, and they can evaluate those muscles to really understand, are your muscles too tight? Do you need to learn how it's not that Kegel Kegel's the opposite of what you want to do. Kegel strengthens, tightens, tightens. Sometimes people have muscles that are too tight. And yep. so learning how to relax those muscles. And if you can learn how to relax those muscles during a sexual encounter. So things like happy baby or rocking your hips back and forth to allow for that pure relaxation so that you can get the buildup and the release that certainly may provide more pleasure. Got and it. It's and it's fun to try. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for those who don't do yoga, happy baby is a yoga pose. So you can Google it so you can see the position. It is a fun position to do. You definitely do feel like a happy baby. Or at least I do. I do giggle every time I'm like, yep, this is like a happy baby. Mm -hmm. And then by the way, one thing too, when you mentioned um, pelvis, I recently saw, and it's funny when you put something out into the universe, all the information comes to you. So just this week, there was a Twitter post about a woman who had had some sort of hip surgery and the way the surgery was done Saw that she post. Now can't, okay. You saw, I think you might've mm. even posted it. I don't even remember now where it came from, but tell us about that. Like, is there a precaution that women should have around? I mean, I, I can't even believe that we'd have to like, I don't know. Do we meet with the doctor and say, Hey, by the way, in this surgery, can you make sure not to do X, Y, Z? Like, I, I, yeah, this is one of those where I don't even know how to handle, but can you tell us um, anatomically what might've happened there? And do you have any recommendations of what women can do to prevent what happened to this poor woman? And maybe you can elaborate a little bit more about what happened. So the nerves to the clitoris, right, come from your spinal cord. So your spinal cord ends around where your rib cage is. And then each individual nerve to the lower half of your body, 
body swim in like a cable, like a, like that there's each individual wire, you know, go and it's called the cauda equina, which stands for horse's tail in Latin, because it looks like each strand of horse's hair, you know, then makes the whole horse's tail. So each nerve kind of travels uh, along the lower half of the, you know, your, your back, and then it disperses to your big toe, to your sciatic, your sciatic nerve and the nerve to your clitoris, the nerve to your pelvic floor and anywhere. So they have to go from your lower back through your hips, around your hips and up to your clitoris. And so anywhere along that pathway, you can get nerve damage, right? So if you're having any type of surgery in your pelvis, on your colon, on your uterus, on your bladder, it's not saying that everyone will have clitoris damage, but if the nerve to your clitoris becomes affected, of course there can be consequences, right? Most of the time people do okay. Most of the time there's no nerve damage. And the problem is because these are the unmentionables and the private parts that we don't talk about, right? Your, your hip surgeon is very rarely gonna say in your you know, pros and cons of you may have problems with your orgasm after this. But if your hip is in so much pain and you're having such bad hip pathology that you cannot walk, most people are gonna say, sure, I'll take the 5% chance that I may have sexual issues because I can't even walk right now. But we don't even give women that option because we don't even put it within the things of, you know, what do you care about? And so for those humans who orgasm from uterine stimulation, and they're a very small percentage of people who do have these incredible uterine orgasms. I had a patient once tell me that she tasted color when she had an orgasm and she lost that ability and she wanted it back. I said, well, I never had that ability. And that sounds amazing. Let's work hard to see if we can get it back. Right. So so if you remove that person's uterus for whatever reason, and some people have to have that kind of a procedure, it may affect their uterine orgasm. And so I want to know before I operate on someone and say, hey, listen, we have to do this surgery because of cancer, because of fibroids, because of bleeding, because for reasons, but it could affect your orgasm if that's the orgasm that you like. And when you wake up from surgery and you have that complication, it becomes, oh, Dr. Rubin, this stinks. This is terrible. I'm very unhappy with this, but I did get warned by my surgeon that this was a possibility. And the problem is we're not warning people because no one talks about sex. Oh, I'm like horrified here. And then what about precautions? Because you had alluded to, you know, someone may try too hard and then it becomes stressful and no fun. And it just made me think, um, you know, we may all want a certain ideal. And I would love to know what precautions we should watch out for. And um, I don't even want to give examples because I don't want to prompt too much because there's probably things that you would share that I wouldn't even think to ask. So yeah, tell us about the precautions people should take on, you know, on this journey of having the best orgasm ever. <laughs> I, I think I think if people look at it from a place of succeeding and, and this is the extra stuff of like, how do we make this even more fun? And I always say, I love sexual medicine because it should be fun. And if you are not having fun, if it is not giving you pleasure or with yourself or pleasure, intimacy with yourself, and it's not furthering healthy relationships, healthy activities for you, and that may be different from your partner, then it's it becomes not the right thing for you and your partner or just you yourself. And so figuring out what that is and figuring out what that is for you, um, you know, I think the key is, is seeing it as fun and pleasure. And if it's bringing you fun and pleasure, then it's probably okay. Although I will say there are things that some people find fun and pleasurable that are actually not a healthy or, or safe or the right thing to do for another human. And so uh, you really do want to um, speak to a provider or speak to your partner about what the right thing is for you and, and, and your partner. Um, but that's what I would say is too often we're really hard on ourselves of like, I'm a, I'm a broken because I can't orgasm from penetration instead of, okay, I can't orgasm from penetration, but if I have this device, I have this pleasurable, amazing time with my partner who cares who's causing it to happen. It's happening and you have pleasure. Your partner has pleasure. Everyone has a good time. That should be seen as success as opposed to I'm broken because my partner can't give me the orgasm. And so a lot of work I do is mind, mindset work is how do we change your mindset a little bit and realizing that you are incredible, you're amazing. And how do we then have even more fun and more relaxation and more enjoyment? And that's when working with like a sex therapist becomes so beneficial, you know, because a lot of the work is just realizing that it's all good stuff and you deserve pleasure and intimacy and good orgasms. 
that is such an incredible way to, to look at it. And may I ask when you shared the example or you stated that um, there are certain things that you may not want to do, is it something that's helpful to share or is it more of just, if I don't feel good about whatever's happening, I should talk to a doctor? I think, I think again, you need to feel safe in your relationship and okay. you need to feel valued in your relationship and your pleasure is as equally important as your partner's pleasure. So if your partner wants to do something that you are not comfortable with, or you don't feel safe about, or that is bothersome to you, then you do need to seek help about how to communicate about it, how to find a happy medium. I'm never going to get every couple to have the same fetishes and to have the same likes and have to the same, um, uh, I'll give you an example. All right, let me give you an example. So I have a 70 something year old uh, uh, female patient and her husband is in his seventies and my patient too. And she came to see me and she said, I, my libido is okay on the treatments you're giving me. I have great orgasms with my devices, but my husband wants oral sex and I just don't want to give him oral sex. I'm in my seventies. I've got arthritis. I'm just not interested. And so then I said to her, well, I hear you, right? You shouldn't have to give your partner oral sex. You've done, you know, your wifely duties over many years. I said, but he's also, it's okay that he wants oral sex. It feels good for him. He likes it. So can we have, can we compromise? They make amazing technological devices that can make him feel like he's getting oral sex. So can we buy a sleeve or a fun device that you can help him with, or he can use on his own that you give, you know, that you can talk about it to say, okay, he gets the feelings of oral sex and you're supporting him in doing that and saying, it's not weird that you want this, but I don't want to do this. And we compromise. And she was thrilled. She went, you know, to, to go uh, give him permission to go get a device like that. And now they could talk about it in a way that wasn't weird. It wasn't like you're bad for wanting this and I'm bad for not wanting to give it to you. And it was like a very happy story that they could now communicate about it. And they use their doctor as a way to sort of make that conversation okay to have. That story says a lot about a lot of things um, at any age. And I think it's um, such an example, a great example that um, really paints the picture for how we should all look at um, intercourse. So thank you for that. Now, earlier on, you had mentioned a couple of conditions. I don't know if there's um, anything specific as far as like symptoms or anything like that, that would also have someone go to a doctor, especially if it's something they wouldn't think of. Um, I, I don't recall the, the names of those conditions, but you did seem to mention that there were a few out there and I didn't know there, if we should raise awareness. There are all sorts of conditions that can affect I can the imagine. orgasm yep. or the clitoris. If it can go wrong with a penis, it can go wrong with the clitoris. And um, we see things that are called post-orgasmic illness syndrome, where you get a headache or you get brain fog or exhaustion, or you feel a lack of pleasure with orgasm and things aren't connecting. There are muted orgasms. There are painful orgasms. There are irritated orgasms. There are all sorts of things that can happen. And all of them, if they bother you, are a medical condition and deserve okay. treatment for it. That doesn't mean all doctors are capable of listening and hearing and knowing what to do about it. So uh, you can always go to um, iswish.org, which is I-S-S-W-S-H, which stands for the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, or ISWISH. And there's a find a provider on there. And there are a handful of, there's more than a handful of, of providers who are uh, very open to helping with this. It doesn't mean they'll have all the answers, but they're at least uh, one to laugh you out of their offices, like unfortunately many doctors will. How do you find the expert? And I actually have a find a doctor page because I'm finding for each of these different questions, there's a whole subset of doctors, but we also need to know the right ones to go to. And so it's been great through my podcast guests to better understand who these experts are that are kind of hidden, hidden uh, away. So I will make sure that I'll post that as well. So people have access to that. So thank you. So anything else that we should talk about that I may not have thought to ask, but you think is important for people to be aware of? I think um, also just looking yourselves and looking at your own body part, like your vulva, your clitoris, it's not all internal. And so getting that mirror out and looking and saying, what does my clitoris look like? What does my vulva look like? Does it hurt anywhere? You know, and, and so it's not just this mysterious private part to you. You know, as doctors, they often hide under a sheet and um, we're like mechanics, right? We're hiding under the sheet. You don't know what we're looking at. And that's a problem. I think that does a, a big disservice to, to humans and, and we don't give them, you know, everyone my office gets a mirror and I say, let me give you a tour of your vulva. And I go step by step and, and just teach. And every, whether you're a Harvard lawyer 
or a congresswoman or, you know, we're in DC, we've got a lot of high powered people is nobody knows this stuff. And nobody's gotten the basic education of what your vulva looks like and is supposed to look like and what happens as hormones change in your body changes. And so I had a 70 year old woman who was who emailed me after the visit. And she said, Oh, my God, Dr. Rubin, you showed me my clitoris for the very first time. And I feel so empowered. I feel so good. That was an amazing visit. And so there is no age with which you can't learn new things or learn new tricks or learn how to have more fun, more pleasure. And that's what makes, again, makes this field so much fun to be a part of. Wow. That is really cool. Um, I love that you give everyone a mirror. Like, wouldn't it be great if like every OBGYN did that as well? Like, come on. So that's my dream is to sort of change that physical exam to make the patient a part of it. And it's a perfect place for education. And you're in that moment and then you can take ownership of, so if something hurts, you have now the words to say, oh, you know, it hurts in my uh, clitoris or it hurts in my pelvic floor or it hurts in my vestibule part of my vulva or my urethra hurts as opposed to, ooh, I just, something's going on down there and I don't know what's going on. And so empowering humans to like take ownership of their body parts and to like make them not feel like shameful places. And, and too often there's so much genital shame, right? No, everyone who comes in says, oh, I'm so sorry I didn't shave or I'm sorry it smells or I'm sorry it's bleeding. You say, do you think a, an ear, nose and throat doctor is bothered by a bloody nose? Do you think like you can, you know, that anything you're going to bring to my office today is going to offend me or bother me at all? And I think you know, at some point it happens where we become shameful of our bodies and uh, where does that start, right? Because my four-year-old doesn't have it. She's, it's a body part like everything else. And so we teach it somehow through culture, through society of this like genital shame and it's super ter- terrible and we have to stop that. Yep, no, absolutely, I agree. So what is your greatest hope for women's health? My greatest hope for women's health is that it becomes so easy to go up to a doctor to see and they just know what to do and know what to find and that your sexual health, your quality of life is valued like any other part of your health uh, in the same way that it is for all genders. And so that would be my hope that sexual health is just health and it becomes easy to talk about, easy to uh, find treatments, uh, easy, affordable, evidence-based treatments uh, to help with any problems. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you so much for making time. This was a fun conversation because I know we sometimes, I mean, I grew up in a very closed minded uh, uh, Southern state, but I had open minded European parents. And it, I, I'm just, I'm honestly just enjoying this because of like, we're able to just talk and be open about this. And, and um, thank you. Thank you. This was a true, true pleasure.